You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to Packers Total Access Chalk Talk Edition. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you'd like to email the show, you can send a message to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. I just want to say that today's show is brought to you by Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. It was birthed out of the burden to help those in our community and congregations who come out of a difficult past and an addictive lifestyle. And we're giving away a uh, autographed Paul Hornig jersey, the Hall of Famer, the Golden Boy. And it's a, a Beckett style, the home green, uh, got the certificate of authenticity, all that good stuff that came from pristineauction.com. If you'd like to enter yourself into that contest, just go to my Twitter page and you will see a tweet at the top of the page that's pinned there. Just make sure you retweet that tweet, uh, follow the account. And then also there will be a link attached to that tweet that shows you how you can donate to Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. And for anyone who donates $5, for every $5 you donate, you will be entered into the contest one additional time. Um, like I said, if you retweet and follow the account, you'll get entered in once as well. So we've got a special guest on the uh, on the line tonight, and that's Coach Han. And we're on here for a Chalk Talk edition. First of all, Coach, we missed you last week, man. It was rough. It was rough without you. How you doing? Uh, I'm good, thanks, man. I really wanted to be there, but, you know, it is uh... – it's winter season. It's basketball season. My wife and my daughter are just all in on it. So I, I had to miss, man. Sorry. No, I completely understand, man. Completely understand. Um, it's just part of it. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to break down seven plays tonight, guys. So we're going to need some uh, some extra. Uh, let's see. what, what How do you say it? here's some some motivation, maybe a little bit of uh, prayers, if you believe in that type of thing, because. It's going to be hard to keep this one under an hour, but I'm excited about breaking it down because, Coach, this was a fun game to watch, man. I know a lot of people, when I seen on Twitter and, and heard some of the other post game shows and podcasts, it was this is a gar- this is two garbage teams and this and that. I, I didn't see that on Sunday, man. I seen some really cool scheming. I seen some big some big time plays. I mean, anytime you got a quarterback that has a 55 yard touchdown run, right? And then you see the uh, the young Christian Watson continuing to break out of his shell. Man, that guy has got blazing speed. But it was a fun game to watch. But really, the idea here, guys, is to is to kind of explain the flow of the game, right? You know, it's easy to look back and look at the box score and go, okay, this is how the game went. But you know, crucial plays happen at crucial moments, and it really dictates how uh, how the next play call will go on the next series, things like that. So we just want to kind of give you the flow in chronological order. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Coach, and uh, and we're going to kind of talk about the first play. It's going to get a little bit funky because I'm going to show the entire screen tonight. But this first play, guys, it came in the first quarter, three minutes left, second and 10 from their own 45, uh, they, they being Chicago. They were up three to nothing at this point. So this game is is really, I mean, the, the first quarter is winding down, three to nothing, low scoring so far. Chicago comes out in a gun 11, double, strong left off, halfback weak. And Green Bay counters with a nickel two four five. Now, to the best of my knowledge, their techs came out in a nine tech, a three tech, a two I, and a nine. And what I noticed on this play here, Coach, was a cat blitz. And um, just to kind of highlight here on mine, and I'm going to turn it over to you. I just want to kind of show that cat blitz and what I picked up. And if you watch here on this play, you'll notice that the corner starts to ease in right here. And as we're showing here, you can see my screen, right, Coach? Yeah, I got you, man. All right, cool. So if you guys notice right down here, out of this nickel 245, you've got the star position, right, guarding the slot receiver. And I just want you to watch him right as the ball snap, you see him fire. So he's coming in. A lot of people, Coach, they've seen this play, and they notice Kingsley and Enigbare really crashes in right here off the edge, and he kind of gets aggressive. He knows that cat's coming off the edge right there, right? So I just kind of picked that up on the pre-snap and thought, man – you know, one of the statistics I saw this year was, you know, Barry is, has blitzed a lot. He's brung five, at least, you know, a minimum of five guys a lot this season, a lot more. I think it was like 40 some percent more than last year. I just wanted to kind of highlight that. I'm going to hop over here and share your screen. And if you would, let's just kind of break down this play again, guys. This is that 55 yard touchdown run that really, really set the stage. 
for the entire night uh, or for the entire day, I should say. But what did you see here, Coach? Yeah, you got my screen here, Clayton? Yeah, sure do. All right, so just like you were saying, this star is going to crash. He's going to go ahead and hold the edge. Um, but I want to kind of show you what happened to the play before that really kind of set this up for Chicago. Um, they were totally cool with wasting a play here early on. This is the play right before that. And I want you to watch the edge defender again. Okay, um, so they're just going to run a, a, a simple toss. This is just essentially wide zone. Um, this is not duo because they're, you're not really looking cut back. You're not winning double teams at the front. This is just a wide zone little toss here. And what they're really keying is the backside. How are you going to treat the backside of zone away runs? And they're seeing Green Bay is going to start in a spill type of defense where they're going to plug all the interior gaps, make this stuff get out to the edge, and then um, trust their outside players to set a hard edge and let those inside backers kind of swing back and forth and play a little more loose and play a little more free. My guess is they got to a spill because Devondre Campbell is back, right? So they're right. going to and spill, cancel all the gaps, get a good edge here, and they see Green Bay gets a, a really nice negative play here out of Chicago. But obviously Chicago is keying on this, right? So they're going to watch the backside, and then this is just – it's really cool what they do. I think it's a good play call by Barry, um, bringing what you call a cat, um, what we call blunder, which is fine, um, where they're just going to bring, like the star you said, off of the C-gap. He's going to hold C-gap, which allows everybody here to go ahead and cross face, and then you are – um, as, as far as gaps go, you're totally gap sound because now you're going to watch this safety crash on the number two receiver. You should be in good position. But I want you to watch the two inside backers here. When you're playing a spill technique like Green Bay is playing, where you're thinking everything's going to get to the outside, these two inside linebackers are actually reading guards. So they're just reading their guards and ready for the guards to take a step. So Chicago, knowing they're playing a, a spill technique, this is so dope, dude. This is the stuff that just makes me smile and, and never want to fall asleep again because watch this left <laughs> tackle. What they're doing here, knowing that Green Bay is reading guards, is instead of pulling a guard on like a long trap or a simulated power or something like that like you normally do, they're going to pull the left tackle in a play we call dart. And it's a cheap way for them to get plus one at the point of attack, right? So you're here logging this with the pulling tackle. This is how you can get the right tackle up and sealing a linebacker really, really quickly. Now, all Justin Fields has to do is read these inside backers. If they're staying home, you're obviously not giving that ball, and they are staying home. They're doing their job. I saw a tweet come out say, Quay Walker's got his back to the play. What is he doing? He's wrong. He's a rookie. He doesn't know what he's doing. That's, that's absolutely wrong. I'm coming out here right now and saying Quay Walker did his job perfectly here. This is a really good scheme. And now Chicago got their best athlete in space, one-on-one, -on -one, and a defender with two lead blockers. He's just got to make one guy miss, real easy block off of the whip route from the slot receiver, and you're off to the races. So, I, like, honestly, with Green Bay coming out in their spill technique, which I still think is the right thing to do when you've got Devondre Campbell back um, to run some of that spill technique right off the bat. It's just a better play call by Chicago and a better athlete in a one-on-one -on -one situation. I don't think it's a scheme thing. I think you've got the guy in position. I mean, you got a player in position to make a play, right? That's all scheme can do is get guys there to make a play. He's in position to make the play. You can see they've got it shut down up front. Um, if that ball were to go to Montgomery, uh, he's probably not going to be able to make the play, but you got the ball in the hands of your special athlete one-on-one. -on -one. That's all a scheme can ever ask for, man. Absolutely, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. And, you know, it's it's funny what you said with uh, with Quay Walker. I was one of those people, too, because when I seen at this point right here, this is the freeze frame that I seen that was like, what in the world? You know, you got Justin Fields out here with the football, right? He's got the ball, just made Keyshawn miss. And you've got Quay simply, I mean, he's literally facing in the opposite direction. I mean, you'd like to see, you'd like to see the rookie be able to read, okay, the running back does not have the ball any longer. But like you said, he was gap sound. So that's really, really good information there, coach. I'm glad you uh glad you pointed that out for sure, because that's that's something that, that's been talked about a lot on Twitter, definitely. So good stuff, man. Let's move on to the next play. So obviously that was a 55-yard touchdown run uh that gave Chicago. Uh, a big lead. Now we're going to fast forward all the way to the second quarter, 849 left. And um, this came, the uh, the Chicago Bears were up 10 to three at this point. And this is the Rasul Douglas forced fumble. Okay. And this is kind of a cool play. Um, we're going to go ahead and highlight it here. Let me fast forward ahead. 
to the next round. All right. So what we have here and what I'm seeing, Coach, is uh, is the second quarter, 849 left, the first and 10. They're at their own 46-yard line. And um, Chicago comes out in an 11-gun double, strong right off. Green Bay counters with a nickel 245. They've got a single high look. And what's cool is they're showing a strong safety blitz here right? They've got the safety in the box. It's kind of like after that opening drive there, Coach, they were like, okay, we learned our lesson. We're going to load this box now and get an extra hat in here to help out with, <laughs> with Justin Fields if he does decide to get loose again. But again, they show the strong safety blitz, and I thought this was really unique, Coach. Like you see, the safety is the one moving at the top of the screen, guys. For those of you on the pod, he is basically over top of the uh, on the outside shoulder of the tight end, right? And they're loaded up here. And then you see the safety pre-snap. It was just a little sugar. He's going to kind of drift back now, and Devondre Campbell is going to slide outside here, outside of the outside of backer here, and they're going to bring a five-man pressure, right? So that's kind of how that unfolded um, as the play went on. And, you know, like I said, the pre-snap safety easing back there and uh, and Campbell showing the blitz. It kind of shows, you know, everybody that you you hear talk about um, when it comes to uh, Joe Barry, coach, everybody's like, oh, it's vanilla. They're just playing soft on the edges and this and that. He's, he's trying to – He's trying to manufacture pressure. You see it over and over again, right? And when it comes to this play in the forced fumble, um, do you have this one on tap no. or no? Okay. No, I skipped this one. That's totally cool, yeah. There, there's nothing in the trenches right here, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, this was, yeah, this so, is a boring play for guys like me. <laughs> exactly. So as we roll it ahead again, they're going to sugar. Here comes the five-man pressure. Fields does a good job reading it, really. I mean, he finds his dig route. But look at Rasul Douglas. Rasul Douglas gets beat on the route. He comes in, and that little peanut punch, right, that peanut Tillman punch, jars the ball out. It was, you know, kind of iffy. Was it a fumble? Was it not? Of course, there wasn't enough, uh, you know, uh, evidence to over overturn it. But I wanted to highlight this play real quick, Coach, because, again, it's 10-3. to 3. If they go down the field right here, first of all, they convert this. This is a first and 10, and they're going to convert it for roughly 15 yards and a first down. They're already in field goal range. They now have a chance to go up by two scores. But luckily for you know for the Packers, Rasul coming in and punching this ball out was absolutely huge. And again, you know my darling of the season. Although he had a pretty rough game, I seen him several times. Um, you know have some mishaps in coverage. Uh, you know as far as some depth issues, things like that. But Rudy Ford comes in and scoops up this funnel fumble, and it just seems like coach every single time that the Packers need to play on defense, Rudy Ford is the one who's coming up with the ball, whether it's a you know, a turnover through interception or recovering a fumble. But again, you got to give credit to Rasul Douglas for forcing that fumble. And I want you to look right here. You see the rookie in a bar, a man, really kind of disrupting the pass a bit too, getting those hands in the air. I've been really, really impressed with him this year, although I didn't think he had a great game on Sunday. But again, you see the push up front too. I mean, you got to give Justin Fields credit here, right, Coach? I mean, you see this. This this ball, there's a small window there. Fields finds it and throws a tight spiral, perfect accuracy on the dig and what should have been a first down. But like I said, luckily, Rasul Douglas comes in and uh, and makes the play there. But what did you think about that play? I mean, that's a, that's a pretty huge play as a coach. you got to be excited, especially if, if you're an offensive coach and you see the defense come up with a turnover, right? Oh, for sure, man. Like, it, there's, i got to roll my eyes when you keep hearing things about, you know, these guys have given up. They're not playing hard, that sort of stuff. Like, these guys are out here balling. Uh, you see that kind of effort from 55 when he knows full well that that right guard is going to, as soon as those hands go up, that is free reign for a guard. You know, you literally work that just about every day in practice of, of your punch drill. So 55 is laying out knowing he's going to get an absolute pop into the rib cage. He's going to get the top of a helmet into, you know, his chin. You know, he, he's laying out to disrupt that, and he knows he's going to eat it, and uh, but good for him. And then Rasul, like, I, I don't think he's beat on the coverage, honestly. That that dig window is there in a quarters-type coverage um, if you can get it over the linebacker, which Fields did. So, like, that dig window is there. He, he knows that's a soft spot in the zone. You saw him redirect his feet really quickly and drive on the top of that route, um, and then just coming through with attitude and effort uh, and just – just pummeling that ball out of there. Um, you know, when I watched it live and watched the replay, uh, I'd have called it a fumble. Like, you know, I'm, I'm coming back right. to my guy saying, hey, you secure the catch. You got to get high and tight with that sucker right away. You know you're in a contact zone in that big window. Um, you got to you gotta secure that catch and, and get upfield with it secure. And um, it's a great play. And it's just guys playing hard. Absolutely. And I know uh, this year it's been easy to rag on Justin Fields and people talk as if he's not an NFL quarterback. And, and I know the numbers may suggest so, but 
I was kind of impressed with him, especially there in the first half. I thought he was accurate with the football. I thought he made fairly good decisions. Now, we know it kind of imploded in the second half, which we will talk about. But um, I'm not ready to write that guy off. I'm a huge Packers fan. I hope he's a bust. And I, I don't mean to be mean or sound cold, but, you know, I want what's best for the Packers as a Packers fan. But, yeah. I mean – He ain't going to be a bust, man. Yeah, he ain't with what be he's a bust. doing, with what he's doing right now – and you could tell, Coach – First quarter of the season, they realize, okay, the passing game is up there. Let's let's make some adjustments. Let's get him more, you know, active in the running game. He's proven he can do that time and time again. If they do get that passing game on par, I think they may have something there. And I, I'm probably going to get, uh, you know, I'm going to look on here afterwards and have a couple less uh, subscribers to the YouTube channel. But hey, it's just like Greg Cosell says on NFL Films, right? If you see it, you got to say it. And I was pretty impressed with some of the things he did other than the uh, the turnovers. So let's move on to the next play. So, again, that that pretty much saved the scoring drive there for the Packers. Now we're going to fast forward. Uh, it, it's just a short time. You know, that was at 849. This one's going to be second quarter, 706. And this is the huge passing play um, from Justin Fields to uh, EQ, Equinemia St. Brown, um, you know, the uh, former Packers wide receiver. This one cut deep, Coach. It cut real deep. But uh, the, the Bears were up 10 to 3 when this play happened. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Do you have this one by chance, Coach? I sure do, buddy. All right, awesome. I'm going to show it. Now, I'm going to show you mine first here and just kind of lay it out. And, uh, you know, the big thing that that I noticed here, like I said, second quarter, you know, the, these these plays kind of happen uh, pretty quick uh, in concession. It, it seemed like, if I remember correctly, Coach, we went basically four and out. I think we went forward on fourth down, turned the ball right back over to them. Chicago comes out in a 12-gun, doubles close, Y on, H flex, halfback right. Green Bay showed a, thir a 34 look here, right? And it's kind of an exotic 34 look. I think I've actually got this one on Next Gen. So I'm going to show you this. This is kind of cool. Um, so this is the Next Gen Stats version. And what would you call this front, Coach? Assuming you can see my screen okay right now. What would you call this front? Obviously, it's a 34, but you've got, you know, your three down linemen right here, obviously. And you've got two other linebackers on the, on the line of scrimmage. This is one of our outside linebackers, Garvin. And, of course, this is Quay Walker, who typically plays inside linebacker. It's funny seeing Big 91 out here in coverage, right? But what what would you kind of call this? Because, again, you know, Green Bay came out in a 34, and it's kind of a 9-tech, a 5-tech, a, a 3, a 1, and a 4. And I'm sure you may have some slot adjustments there that you would disagree with. That's totally cool. And uh, I know that Quay Sugar's on this play, but what would you call that front? Man, it looks pretty exotic, right? Yeah, yeah, this is an inverted bear front. Um, you're going to have your three down linemen here with your two quote-unquote outside backers walked up, one of them being an inside backer, and you're playing some of that switch with 91 out. Um, so it's an inverted bear look, uh, and the invert comes in with the mic standing up there. They're mugging it. We call it mug. Um, they're trying to get the bears in in man protection. They're trying to get that left, that left tackle, excuse me, to fan out to Quay or to push out um because they're assuming that tight end is taking off on the route so they're trying to get him to push out that's a, a pretty cheap way to get some one-on-one -on -one pressure with only a three-man rush gotcha because whether he's coming or not they've got to account for him right so exactly. um good stuff man i wanted to show that and i'm, I'm going to kind of roll this a little bit here too because you know joe barry's been catching a lot of flack and it's it's fire joe barry season right now he seems to be the whipping boy you know several weeks ago it was darnell savage darnell savage couldn't play in this game so obviously now everybody's on the fire joe barry train <laughs> but I, I just want to point out to me coach everything looked covered here and i want you to correct me if i'm wrong but as we roll this forward here on next gen stats i mean everything looks like it's fairly covered. And and to me, this looks like just a blown coverage by Ja. I mean, it, it's it's like he almost did not expect 19 to have that much speed to outrun him. Now, you correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think I don't think he's expecting Rudy Ford number 20 to help over the top there. Obviously, Amos is uh is providing some protection over the top on the right side of the field, but I'm going to go ahead and unshare my screen. I just wanted to kind of point that out on next gen stats because that really uh really caught my attention, but what did you see here on this play? I'm going to go ahead and share your screen for you. Perfect. Yeah, um, you're dead on it. Uh, he's not going to get – Jaws not going to get any help over the top. Um, they're going to end up in a cover four look, but it's really pre-snap. It's going to be cover three, um, and they're going to run cover three rules with your safeties here where he's going to take this third. This safety has got to take the middle third. He's going to get a vertical release from the tight end right here. So he's going to get that tight end to start to break the hips of the inside backers. So he's got to treat that as a vertical as this tight end starts to bend that out into like what we call a lazy rolled out. 
And then the only reason that this corner can come into play here and make it look more like a cover four look is because you get the mesh look right over the top here from number one. So as soon as that happens, he's reading number one, then he can go ahead and rob any vertical route, which you get from the number two receiver here. What that does is put your best dude right here on an island, right? And you're, you're Green Bay, you're saying our best cover dude against their best receiver. I want you to watch Jaws' feet here, Clayton. He's going to go ahead and bail knowing that he's got a cushion. His first step is forward, which I don't love. You know, we've we've seen a lot of aggression from Ja in this game. Um, yep. He's jumping, he's jumping the the screen routes. Um, he got he got caught on that a little bit as well uh, later on in the game. Um, so he's aggressive and he's playing like he's got safety help over the top, but he doesn't. And then he gets on a skateboard right here, and this is something that we never see Ja do, right? Like his his footwork, his technique is always just so pure. Um, gets himself a little caught there with that forward step, and as soon as he's flat footed here, baby. It's gone. You know, EQ is – he's fast, right? So What is it they say, Coach, if we're if they're even, they're leaving? Is that what well, they that's say? That's exactly what it means, man. If they're even, they're leaving. You know, and EQ is fast. You still got to flip your hips. You're in funnel technique or inside technique here, hoping that you get some safety help late. But with the vertical push from the number two receiver, that tight end on that side, you're just not going to get that help. And you can see the distance he puts between himself. Now, first of all, great job by Ja here staying disciplined – because it does save the touchdown. I know they'd go on to score on that drive, but if you're beat like this and you get your head back around, you're giving up a touchdown. So Jaws doing a good job of working back into phase, but you can see just how small that margin of error is for your elite top, top level corner, right? So we're gonna get a better look at the footwork right here uh, from Ja on this TV angle where he's a little staggered, he's flat footed and walking back and he's expecting, I think from film study, He's expecting that dig. And when he's expecting that dig, he's thinking he can undercover it, undercut it, excuse me, because then he'll naturally have help from the top. And we're going to get to that play later because they came back to it. But because he's expecting the dig from EQ, when he gets even with it, he knows he's in trouble, does a great job of getting at least back into phase so he can stop the play. But yeah, that's exactly what had happened there. Good stuff, man. Good stuff. Yeah. That was one of the big things that, that stood out to me because, you know, I immediately thought, you know, that, that's probably the biggest play, other than the 55-yard touchdown run, that's probably the second biggest play of the, of the day, you know. So just to recap, guys, how we got to this point, how are the Packers trailing, in my opinion, and you correct me if, I, if you disagree, Coach, but the 55-yard touchdown run, again, it wasn't scheme. It was simply Keyshawn Nixon did not make the tackle, right? Quay Walker was playing sound, uh, according to you and many other people, Coach. So – how can you put that on the defensive coordinator? Now, when you talk coaching, I get it. You know, when you talk coaching, you think, okay, it, it is the coach's job to prepare the players to to perform at a high level. And I get that. And there's always room for criticism for everyone. But um, for me, man, I just I look at this and I go back and watch the tape, and I'm like, this doesn't look like a Joe Barry problem. It looked like an execution problem to me, and I just didn't see anything schematically. So, um, yeah, good stuff, man. Let's move on to the next play. So again. That led to, like Coach said, a scoring drive there, right? And and it, it, I completely agree. It's awesome that Ja played discipline there at the end, prevented the touchdown, kind of played damage control on the backside of that play. But then it led to a uh, a touchdown run from Montgomery, which, uh, in my opinion, man, Quay really got really got kind of bowled over into the end zone. And you, it's one of the things I've said about Quay is he's been out of place at times and and uh, and missed some tackles. But man, when he makes contact, he usually brings a thump. And I was really surprised to see him kind of getting drove back into the end zone. But, again, that led to a scoring drive. So now the next play is in the second quarter. There's only 17 seconds left. Coach, I was screaming. I was screaming on this play. Chicago's winning 16-3. to three. And you know how I am, man. Every Everything that I kind of uh, look at as far as importance to the game is turnover differential and middle eight. And here we are in the middle eight. It's fourth down, and I'm screaming, take the points. When you got a chance to win the middle eight, three to nothing, and then let's see if we can come out of just in the second half and win this ball game. They say, uh-uh, we're going to go for it. So they go for it on fourth and four, and this is at Chicago's 14. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and kind of show what I'm seeing on this play. And um, let me get ahead here, make sure I'm in the right spot. I think this is it. Yeah. Okay, so Green Bay comes out. I haven't seen this very much this year, and maybe I've overlooked it, but they come out in 11 gun trips, Y flex. And coach, I would call this a 79 snag halfback shoot. 
Um, you know, the snag could be kind of inverted if you want to, because essentially what you've seen on this play, and I'm going to try to go to the next gen if I can find it, make sure I get the right one pulled up here. Um, well, it's already reset. Never mind. Okay, we'll get to that in a second. I'll pull it up when you're talking. Um, the uh, With the 79 snag, basically you've got a corner route on the outside is what I'm seeing. Uh, with the seven route, you've got a, a nine route. If you want to go ahead and jump to the nine, you've got Christian who's kind of working this seam on a nine route. And then you've got or a skinny post, if you will. And then with the snag, essentially what a snag is, guys, is where it's a concept where you've got a two-receiver concept where one is going deep and another is coming underneath, whether it's on a, a quick drag or a slant route. Um, this is more of a fade, which kind of made me think the snag could have been, you know, Christian with the outside Samori Torre. And then, of course, the you could just call it a nine fade, but essentially they're looking for kind of that, that snag concept. You've got a halfback shoot out here. But right off the bat, Coach, the thing that really stood out to me on this play, and I wish I had the all 22. It's kind of hard to see on the TV copy. But the thing that really stood out to me was number 57, this backer, does a good job of pinching uh, down on uh, Christian Watson. Christian's wanting to get skinny right here. He knows he's got to clear the backer, and the backer really kind of jams him out there and just throws him off course, just reroutes him just enough that Aaron doesn't feel comfortable throwing that. And the thing that really stands out, Coach, is, is Aaron just staying poised in the pocket. Like, if there's one thing that Aaron's done throughout the course of his career really well is he doesn't panic in the pocket. He kind of – you see him manipulate it. Like right here, we've seen him roll right so many times. Guys, he's not planning on running backwards here. He's simply trying to get that edge to bite in so he can step up and then, of course, delivers a strike to Christian Watson here for the 14-yard uh, touchdown pass. And um, I'm going to try to pull up the next-gen stats – a clip of this here in just a second while you're talking coach so I can kind of show that diagram a little bit better but again look at Aaron in the pocket here I mean just poised this offensive line coach they've been playing a lot better in pass protection thank it's you thank think, you <laughs> let's go right guard and center look at this look beautiful at that. Stunt pickup, beautiful. baby this yeah, and look at Yash right here Yash knows I'm not living I'm not letting him have the outside and look at him rebound right here like right here he looks beat coach uh -huh. and then watch Yash that's like, ah, no, we're going to get right back in here in the center, right right in between the pads. Just a great job, man. Great job there. Huge play. And then, again, let's look at Christian here before I turn it over to you. You see that linebacker is going to kind of jam him out, really pinch that off. Christian knows right here, guys, okay, I am not going to get that seam. And I just love – what's he do, Coach? We, we talk about it all the time, right, on the scramble drill. Look at your quarterback. And it was so cool in the press conference right here – is the moment that Christian was talking about. He said, I I knew they were in too high, and I thought as soon as I seen Aaron was in trouble, let me just try to get over to the right side because they're going to be in man. And, you or, you know, you see it's, you know, whether it's zone or true man, it's it's man principles. And, of course, he mugs Lazard. Lazard has been on the turf and routes more than anybody this year, but we won't even talk about that. But look at Christian work back here, Coach. I mean, what a great job. And, again, yeah, this, the, this the throw really wasn't easy. perfect, but look at that, man. Great possession catch. I thought he was just supposed to be a speed guy, Coach. He's out here making possession catches. Pretty cool stuff. But what did you see here is I'm going to share your screen real quick and try to find that next gen. Yeah, I don't got that one pulled up either, but um, I'm going to okay. go ahead and just let you know what I've been seeing. Essentially, um, what you see from Christian Watson on what you just showed us there is maturity, right? It, it's starting to learn and understand the rules that the Green Bay Packers have of I'm capped. You know, there's a safety right over the top of my route. He didn't drive in. I didn't get to cross his face. Therefore, I am capped. This route is dead. Now I have to spin that sucker out and go find green grass. And that's exactly what these option routes that Green Bay runs so well, that's exactly what they're looking to do. And if you can't quite get those option routes going down, uh, it's going to be a long day. We saw that at the beginning of the season. But the encouraging thing for Packer fans is you're starting to see that a little bit. We saw that from Tour Aid, you know, two, three weeks ago, whatever that was. We're starting to see it from Watson where they're starting to understand a capped, uncapped rule, how to start to find green grass. That tells you that they're really understanding the route dynamically, meaning they're understanding who everybody's, what everybody's job is. They're understanding the comp routes. They're understanding the scramble drills so that they're not running two guys into the same area anymore. They're not staying dead anymore. Essentially what they're doing is saying, I'm capped. Let me get open quick. But one thing we just kind of breezed over, dude, that right guard in that center. Oh, my God. That twist pickup, that blitz pick or that uh, that stunt pickup on the inside was yeah. beautiful. John Runyon and Josh Myers came together and absolutely put that dude on roller skates. Um, that's everything you want to see from the offensive line. You talked about Josh Nyman's redirect. The fact that Zach Tom was able to take him up the hoop 
and buy Aaron time. Like, don't get me wrong. Christian Watson, great job on that. Shows maturity. But, yo, this offensive line is where it's at, baby. Absolutely. And Elton Jenkins, you can see the screen right now, right, Coach? Yeah, I got you. Okay, cool. So in this next gen stats, for those of you listening on the pod, the one thing I want to point out too here with Elton when he's talking about picking up that, did you call, did you call this specifically a twist? Is that what you call this? Yeah. Or it, okay. Yeah. So what you got is 93 and 96, the two interior defensive linemen are going to change spots. And it's so cool. 71 and 76 picks up 93 easy. And look at Elton Jenkins, coach. He had one of his highest graded uh, performances all year long. And you see why right here. He just stays at home, passes 93 off and just kind of hugs 96. And, I mean, it does not get any better than that. Aaron has really got trust in this offensive line now, man, and it is, uh, it's really, really fun to watch for sure. So, again, Watson, you know, like he said in the presser at the end, he knew it was too high, works his way out of that. And uh, the, that's the type of stuff that Aaron was talking about when he said we've got to develop trust. We've These guys have got to know it's, it's not about – it's not what to do, but it's why you're doing it, right? And in that situation, Christian knows my route's dead. He pinched off the skinny. You can't get the skinny. Okay, cool. We're in too high. I'm looking back. Aaron's in trouble. Let me work back to, to open grass, and it's money, man. I absolutely love it. I know you're excited about this next play because Chicago was up 16 to 10. This came in the fourth quarter, 14-41 left, right? First and 10 play. Boy, when you can get a big gainer on first and 10, coach, it is lovely, right? So – Fourth quarter, 14-41 left. Like I said, first and 10, Chicago's 21. Green Bay comes out in an 11-gun. Guys, we have got to stop screaming um, that the, the, the shotgun run doesn't work because I'm telling you, I ran the numbers here recently, and my goodness. I think we were – uh, in, in one specific game where we had people complaining on Twitter, I was like, let me go look at it. Is it really that bad? We averaged over six yards of carry running out of the gun. And and there's nothing I love better, Coach. I'm I'm an old-school football fan. Line up in the eye and let's pound that sucker, right? I love watching that kind of football. But to see them run out of the gun in the way that they can kind of manipulate defenses is really exciting. So um, I was going to ask you this. First of all, it's an 11-gun, doubles close, strong right off, halfback same. And tell me this, Coach. I'm going to share your screen real quick. Is yeah. this a – is this – would you consider this a zone or a duo on this play? That's a really good question. Um, you get that You get that question a lot. You know, what is the difference between zone and duo? Um I'm calling this zone all the way simply because of the running backs aiming points here and the fact that the tight end is not attached. Okay. So you can only really truly run duo. I'm sure somebody can tell me how you do it out of a balanced formation, whatever. Um, you can only run duo if the tight end is a part of it, because then you're working all of these true double teams up to the inside linebackers. The fact that the tight end disappears here and kind of a, a read type scenario, um, disconnect scenario, this and the running back's aiming point, instead of going downhill to the near foot of the center, he's going to get wide out to the play side guard's foot. Um, that tells me that this is simply wide zone. This is um, bread and butter play. The cool thing about it, though, is the way that they manipulate Chicago. And the way I'm going to go ahead and get to the, I'm going to fast forward through all this, and I'm going to go ahead and, and stream up to the all 22 shot because this is just dope. They've been seeing this from Chicago all the time. You got a one tech and a three tech here and they're both bent and you got two inside linebackers stacked on top of them right here, which tells me that Chicago is going to play a little one gap, two gap stuff here. They're going to go ahead and try to eat both of these gaps with the nose. They're going to try to eat and then lag tech with him. They're going to keep those linebackers free. And all of a sudden Chicago is playing spill technique, right? And they're just going to try to knife in and close out B gap with this defensive end. So Chicago, or Green Bay, excuse me, sees that Chicago is playing spill technique and they see that they're in man. And what happens if you motion the receiver across the formation, and they're in man, where is your edge? You don't <laughs> have an edge anymore because homeboy had to go with the receiver, right? So all you got to do, knowing that that D end is going to knife inside the B gap, it's the easiest block in the world for your left tackle, Zach Tom, who had not outstanding day that tells me if we can gel wedge with Sam here, I'm here with what we call a second ladies and gentlemen let me ask you a question have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network well now you have because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. 
So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular built for us. Terms apply. Awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. All right, we may have lost Coach. Coach, if you can hear me, you cut out there, pal. It looks like your signal went down a little bit. I think your energy level was just a little too, a little too much for the system right here. <laughs> so hopefully coach will rejoin us here in a second. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen while he uh, is gone here and kind of give you the next gen look at this and, and what he was talking about. Of course, he, like he pointed out, this was wide zone, right? This was a wide zone run. And what he was talking about with the pre-snap motion. If you'll notice number 39 right here, hopefully everybody can see my screen, though, for those of you listening on the pod. This is on the weak side of the formation. So this is on the left side of the formation. They are going to do a little uh, little pre-snap motion here with Christian Watson. And you guys know they were setting this up all day long. Christian Watson motions right. 39 goes with him. The edge is gone. You've got Zach Tom and Elton Jenkins swallowing up number 55 here. I mean, absolutely swallowed him up. And A.J. Dillon is untouched until he gets to number 36. And you could tell he was not going to be denied on that play. Again, that double team block was Zach Tom and Elton Jenkins, man. They really, really seem to be hitting it off well, working in combination, you know, in, in cahoots together there. And then Josh Myers, too, another thing worth noting is him getting to the next level. Watch the center number 71 here gets to the next level. It's not the per, It's not a perfect block. It's not a clean block, but he does get just enough of 57 to slow him down. He gets pulled up in, gets caught up there with 64, and A.J. Dillon is off to the races. So I'm going to try to go to my copy here, and then we're going to check back and see if Coach – Coach, if you can hear me and you're back in, you go ahead and speak and let me know. But we're going to move up here to the A.J. Dillon run again. Here's the pre-snap motion. You see 39 come over with him. And off the Dillon, you see the double team there with Tom and Jenkins. Here you can see where Josh Myers gets up there and gets just in the way. He gets a little swim move there by number 57, the inside linebacker. But, again, it was enough to take 57 out of the play. A.J. Dillon full head of steam. And there ain't no safety preventing number 28 from getting into the end zone. Again, let's go to the all 22. You will see the uh, pre-snap right here. Pre-snap motion, man coverage, pulls him over. There's no edge. There's a double team block on 55. Myers gets out there, gets a little chip block, and bam, AJ Dillon is in for six. Absolutely awesome stuff, man. Love it, love it, love it. And uh, yeah, so coach, if you can hear me, um, just try to rejoin if you'd like to the same link. And uh, yeah, you'll be good to go. If not, we'll go ahead and roll on here for the podcast sake. I know we got a lot of people listening um, here on uh, on the uh, on the afternoon show. So. Let's move on to the next play, guys. Again, you know, that A.J. Dillon run, the reason we highlight it, it's early in the fourth quarter, Chicago was up 16-10, to 10, right? And, um, yeah, so they were up 16-10. to 10. We get the, the touchdown run, puts us ahead, um, huge, huge play. And then, you know, later in the fourth, it's 248 left. It's a first and 10, Green Bay's 43. This is Chicago with the ball. And we're talking about the Jair Alexander interception. And, uh, man, this was uh, – 
this was a fun play, and I was really hoping we would have Coach on here. I'm going to just try to hit him up in the chat real quick and tell him to try to rejoin because I know we talked about this. This was being set up. And um, let me see here. Try to rejoin. Same link. All right, so with the Jair Alexander play, let's go ahead and fast forward ahead here. And, you know, the it's one of those things, guys, with Ja. It was tough watching him get burned. You know, we only showed one play where he got burned. And um, that play specifically that we showed, um, we showed for a reason. Because he's been overly aggressive this year and he's gotten burned several times. You know, we didn't show the play to the tight end because it actually led to a blocked field goal. It didn't impact the game as much as it possibly could have, right? But when it comes to this play right here or the the other play to EQ that we showed him getting burned, obviously that led to a touchdown. That is a, a game-altering play for sure. So right here, late in the game, you know, the Packers are up 20-19. to 19. I mean, this is a freaking nail-biter, and you need your defense to come up with a play. I remember thinking, okay, I think I even said it in the chat, on the Packernet chat. I was like, all right, it's the defenses to lose now. The offense did what they had to do to get out in front. Let's see how this defense responds. Chicago comes out in an 11-gun, strong left, tight doubles, halfback weak. They run a double curl flat, halfback stab. So basically what you got here, guys, as we roll it forward, is you're going to notice that they're going to run two flats and two curls, okay? So you've got these two. You got the tight end on this side and then the receiver on this side. This is going to be more of a leak, but you can see they're going to kind of go to the flat, right? And then they're going to be curls over the top. So it's a curl flat uh, route concept. Okay, so that's what they were trying to accomplish here. You know, Green Bay, they countered with a nickel two four five. They had a nine tech, a three tech, a one tech, and a nine tech. And and John knows right here, guys, that he's got Amos over the top. If you see, he's got Amos helping him over the top, uh, no doubt about it. So he can be aggressive on this left side. So as he goes to run this curl route, you see Ja just steps in. Jumps the route, bang, interception, and guys, that all but sealed the ball game. To be honest with you, I mean, when you when you get that interception there, you know, okay, we got a good chance of grinding this clock out. Absolutely huge play. But again, you know, when you talk about Fields, and we talked about he had a great first half, he had kind of a bad second half. When you look at this play, I want you to watch the leak. You've got a receiver here that's playing that tight doubles, okay, and he's going to chip. He's going to chip on the uh, on the edge defender and he's going to run a little leak route. That was Fields' play. Right there, Fields has got to recognize there's too many hats over here on this side of the field. Dump it in the flat. It's a first and 10 play. Luckily for us, it was an inexperienced quarterback. But again, when we're, when we're bashing Barry and saying this scheme is flawed and this and that, where is the scheme flawed right here? Like this is a good play call. Look at Ja. Ja knows he's got Amos over the top. He can be aggressive underneath, jumps the route, bang. Right. Great play by Ja. Don't get me wrong. But again, that th this Barry called up the perfect play call here. He, you know, when you look at it, and I would I'd love to pull it up on next gen stats. I don't want to bore you through me trying to search for it here. But when you look at how that play was designed, I mean, it was perfect execution. It was the perfect play call, and it came at the perfect time. I mean, game on the line. You know, on offense, we talk about it all the time. And I want to check here and see if coach is back in yet or not. Man, he was really wanting to highlight that play. Looks like yeah, it looks like he's uh, he's out, so definitely appreciate his time. Um, but when you look at that type of play and, and, and on offense, what do we talk about? We talk about when the game's on the line, when you need a big play, thank players, not play, right? We talk about it all the time. It's Pat Kerwin 101. And on defense, it's the same type of thing. You know, let's, let's go all the way back, and it looks like we may have Coach coming back in here in just a second. But uh, if you go all the way back to the Washington game, all right, Coach, I think we got you back, man. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, hey, you got me? Yeah, I got you, man. It's it's good. It's totally cool. I was just uh, talking about the Jair Alexander interception. I'm not sure. Do you have that one? I sure do here. Let me okay. grab it quick. I'm loading huddle up. I'm so sorry, bro. Of course. No, dude, no. It's, listen, it's totally cool, man. I know things happen. There's been a couple times I've been live, and guys had to fill in for me like, okay, Clayton went pause here. Let's just talk for a second. So it's totally cool. But uh, – yeah, I was just talking about, you know, Pat Kerwin 101 is when a game's on the line, think players, not plays. Oh, and sure. uh, from, from someone who's a, a big schematic geek and and someone who I, I've, I've tried to prove that wrong every year that I've been a football fan and I can never do it. And I was just saying that it's funny on defense, 
you know, you want your best player in a position to make a play when the game's on the line. And I rewound all the way back to the Washington Commanders game, and and Barry did it in that game. The game was on the line, crucial third down. He had Ja on McLaurin, had him following him, had a chance to make a play, and Ja just didn't make the play. But here on this play, if you'll share your screen, I'll share it for you when you're ready. You just let me know. Um, yeah. yeah, just let me know when you got that up. But yeah, I can pull it up, too. There we go. All right, cool. I'm going to go ahead and share it for you. So, like I pointed out, I kind of walked through the play there. Um, again, it was an 11 gun strong left tights double, tight doubles, halfback weak. I seen a double curl flat, flat with a halfback stab route, and uh, obviously the uh, the double curl flat on the right side is is kind of one of those leaks, one of those block leaks, one of those little chips. But talk to me here what you seen with Ja because you know we talked earlier how he got too aggressive, and then of course the play we didn't show where the tight end had a deep catch on him. He got too aggressive on the sit and go, which it was more of a sit. The 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 play broke down, and then the tight end went. But here you see the aggressive uh, aggressive play of Jair Alexander paying off, right? Well, yeah, and this is where Joe Barry just says, "All right, Jai, you want to play aggressive? I'm gonna give you the chance to." You know, as you just said, players not plays, right? So Barry does a great job of scheming it up. Where we had talked earlier, where Ja got burnt, thinking that he's gonna have that dig route coming from EQ. He's, he's playing a little flat-footed, and EQ just went past him. Well, here, Barry's going to say, all right, Ja, you know, you're, you're our best dude. Um, we're going to go ahead and let you take this. Uh, when we get to the all-22 angle on this sucker, you'll see he's got safety help over the top. So he's allowed to be aggressive, right? Like, that's, that's dope. That's a great adjustment by your defensive coordinator. Exact same technique here, you know, but now he's going to get safety help over the top. So now he can bail, and literally all he's looking at is the hip of the receiver right here. And the second that hip starts to dip down like he's in a break, he can go ahead and redirect his feet and bite on that. Right there, you see the sit. The, yep. You can see Jaws already starting to open. So that foot, that's a great anticipation. It's a great job by him knowing that they're going for the sticks here. As soon as he breaks, he knows he can go on the ball. He can bypass it. He can go get himself that pick. He can seal the game knowing that if it is a stutter, a double move, something like that, number one, that Bears O-line is going to have to hold up. Number two, he's got safety help over the top. It's a great job. Absolutely. Completely agree. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to share my screen real quick. we got the next-gen stats tracker here and kind of give you guys an idea of an overhead view of what we're talking about. Again, you've got the double curl flat. You can see them here. Here's the double curls. Here's the flats underneath. This one over here is a little delay chip leak. And, of course, you got the stab route by the halfback. And like I was telling them when uh, when we lost connection there, Coach, you know, and you just pointed it out as well, Amos over the top, Ja knows, 31 over the top. I can be aggressive here, man. I can be aggressive, right? Bang. He's got help. And, and Amos has no one to cover out there. This is – I don't – I don't understand a better play call right here in this situation. I mean, it's a first and 10 play and you don't want to be overly aggressive, but I mean, this is, this is just the backbreaker for the Chicago bears. Now, like I had pointed out hindsight's 2020, but obviously it being a first down, you want to live for another down. The the right place to go with the ball is definitely in the flat on the right. In my opinion, that's probably where you got the most or even dump it to 32 there on the stab route and you'll pick up four or five, maybe six yards of play for second down. And it's just, the inexperience of Justin Fields and what we talked about. He had a great first half, made some mistakes in the second half, but love how you pointed out the uh, the technique there, Coach, especially with Ja reading the hips of the receiver. Uh, absolutely phenomenal there, man. So, again, guys, that came with in the fourth quarter, 248 left in the game. They're driving. They're on Green Base 43. All they need is a field goal. You're expecting them to get in field goal range. Granted, you need to get pretty far down there with the win there in Chicago yesterday, but uh, – they, uh, they had every reason to be more patient. They got a little too aggressive, and John made them pay. So big pick there. And now, of course, it's still a one-point game. And this next play is just – I mean, it's literally a minute later, Coach. And this is the one that's fun, man. We've seen with the A.J. Dillon play, the motion, right, the pre-snap motion of, uh, of uh, Christian Watson. And that's really what opened everything up. It, it, you know, it showed it showed everybody they're in man coverage. He took 39 over. It allowed the double team block to swallow up number 55. Myers got to the second level, put a chip on the mic, and AJ Dillon was off the races. And God loved the safety because he was not going to stop Quadzilla from getting in that end zone. Huge play. And I remember, coach, watching on the telecast, and the announcers said pre-snap, literally as the play is snapped, as the ball is snapped, they said fake to Watson, hand to Dillon. 
And then we come back again. This is 151 left in the fourth quarter. It's a second and seven play from Chicago's 46. Green Bay's going to come out in a gun 11, tight double, um, tight doubles, strong left off. What I've got here, Coach, is Y motion Z jet. And I'm going to let you – do you have this play? I'm pretty sure you do, right? Uh, no, I didn't pull this one up because this one was – Easy. I didn't have to grab this one because it's literally <laughs> get the ball to the best player on the field. <laughs> Got it. I'm going to show you on my screen so we can kind of walk through here. If you want to walk through it, it's totally cool. First of all, though, let's just kind of let's go here to the TV copy. And then you see right here, Y motion, right? The Y receiver is obviously, as we said, pre-snap here, um, strong left off. That's the tight end. He comes off the line of scrimmage. He's going to motion right. There's your Y motion. And then here comes your Z jet. Coach, I seen an angle, and I shared it on Twitter, of Christian Watson from the stands. They're in the upper deck there in Chicago. This guy is cooking. Look at it. First of all, look how he gets into the motion here. Like every bit of momentum, he's ready. Bang. Look at that edge. My goodness. And, and Coach, when he got to this point right here, when I seen Sammy Watkins peel back and throw that block, I'm like, he's gone. There is nobody, nobody going to catch that kid right there. And he's off to the races. And, of course, you got the celebration that everyone had so much fun with. He said afterwards, once I got in the air, I was like, what do I do now? <laughs> so, luckily, he wasn't hurt on the play. Let's go to the replay here. And, again, here he comes across the formation, Z-Jet. And I love this, this right here, Coach. Look at number 55 here. He is lost. <laughs> How do you – what, what, did, what did Chicago – maybe that's the better – the better question for you, Coach. What did Chicago do wrong here um, in this play? Because, again, Green Bay spent the entire day kind of setting this up, right? And yeah. what, what did you think that they did wrong on this play? What Chicago did wrong on this play was do everything right, um, honestly. <laughs> like, that's the problem. This is Green Bay getting back to old Green Bay stuff, right? We talked about it a little bit beforehand, right before I cut out. And obviously, you know, the internet's going to cut out of my favorite play when you're running wide zone off of formational <laughs> um, adjustments and, and motion to get yourself a bare edge. But Green Bay's literally watching Chicago's defense be really sound and really disciplined and reading their keys incredibly well. And that's what Chicago's doing here is reading their key keys exceptionally well. They've got a second and seven situation, and they're in man coverage. How do you know it's man coverage? Well, you just brought the Y across the field and had him set up in Tripp's bunch, and as soon as you brought him across the field, that other dog, that outside backer came with him. So you know, oh, we got this, baby. We got this thing in the bank. So all you're going to do is run zone right. The cool thing about it is watch it again. The offensive line has no idea that Christian Watson got that ball. Two people yeah. on the field knew that Christian Watson got that ball. Rodgers and Watson. Look at Sammy Watkins. He's like, uh, oh, crap, I better go block. Like, that's that's just the finite points of this offense where now you're actually starting to click. People don't understand how difficult it is to time this play up. You're under center. You've got to snap it. Not only is Watson coming in motion at full speed, but he is coming in motion at depth because he's got to get around the off wide receiver. He's got to get around that tight end. So he's at depth. So you've got to get the snap timed absolutely perfect. It's got to be a clean exchange. We saw that ball hit the ground a couple of times early in the season. Rodgers and Watson been working this, right? They've been working, been working. The cool thing is watch Elton Jenkins, your left guard. Watch him through this whole view. Has absolutely no idea. He's, oh, it just clipped out there. He turns around a little bit, turns his head to the right, thinking his running back is going to cut off his butt and go score right? Like they have no idea. And if the offensive line has no idea that this play is coming, how cool is it when they get to turn and see like, what better read can you give on a play action type of thing or a, a false step type of thing to the defense than to not let the offensive lineman know what's going on. They're blocking zone, right dog. And the whole defense goes with them and you get the ball to the best player on the field. These are the little things that really give you hope to the offense. Now, these little things that are starting to finally come together and they take time a lot lot of time scramble drill takes time stunt pickups take time little timing things like this it all takes time but now that it's starting to gel y'all watch out for green bay love it absolutely love it and i love what you pointed out there that if the offensive line doesn't know who's getting the ball how in the world is the defense going to know right it reminds me of the old saying you know loose lips sink ships right <laughs> so if they if they literally don't know what's going on how in the world is the defense and again christian watson right here look at this body lean coach Right there. Mm -hmm. Like he mm -hmm. is 
he's about to throw it into fifth year and he is gone. Yeah. You can't Absolutely. teach that. There's just, there's no coaching. There's no teaching. There's, if I could teach that, we would win state every year, but there's no <laughs> teaching. That. That's just the best athlete on the field right now. Absolutely, man. And what's so cool too, is if I heard the stat correctly, I believe they said they clocked him. He's the second fastest player or wide receiver to be clocked this year. I think it was at 21. I don't want to overindulge you. I think it was 21.8 miles an hour. Um, dude, it's just eating in a school zone is what he's doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. Dude. I love it. Love it. So again, that play, the thing that stood out to me the most and, and what better way um, to end uh, the chalk talk segment than with the play that they set up the entire day to the best of my knowledge, coach, I don't think they handed, they, they gave the ball off on that jet sweep one time until that play. So they were setting it up all game long. It's easy to go on Twitter. It's easy to kind of get out there and go, well, yeah, Chicago's a bad team, and, and yeah, they just beat a bad team, blah, blah, blah. And, guys, you have got to acknowledge Coach LaFleur called an awesome game plan. Like Aaron Rodgers and the rest of the offense did a great job protecting the football. On defense, yeah, you gave up a few big plays, but at the same time you won the turnover differential. So essentially, when it comes down to the middle eight, and and again, this isn't a gambling show. Um, I like to play a little friendly action on the side, but when it comes to halftime, you know, I looked at the halftime score. I look, you know, I always kind of come come down to that middle eight, coach. And and during the halftime, uh, you know, whatever halftime show celebration, I go in and I look and I go, okay, who's winning the middle eight? Green Bay was winning the, winning the middle eight seven to nothing, because. Uh, you know, luckily they went for it on that fourth and four when Clayton was screaming, kick the points, you know, kick the field goal. So they win the middle eight, seven to nothing. They win the turnover differential two to nothing. Sure enough, I hop over to, to FanDuel. Green Bay was plus two and a half, even though they were, you know, even though they were losing, it was real close. I said, you know what, let me put a little action on that. And it cashed in. So, um, again, it ain't a gambling show, but I just wanted to point that out, that some of the numbers that people are looking at this year um, from a Vegas standpoint is simply um, – Middle eight turnover differential, and then of course PPP, which is points per play, and uh, that's kind of the things that you want to key in on when you look at these teams. And go, who, who's really playing well? And uh, another team, coach, as we get ready to wrap up, is Seattle. I don't know if you've gotten a chance to check out what they're doing, but man, I, I to the best of my knowledge, they're still number one in the uh, National Football League in points per play. And Geno Smith has just been resurrected. I mean, it's just unbelievable what they've been able to do out there. And I honestly believe that their offensive coordinator, I can't believe, I can't remember his name right offhand. You may know it, but he came from the LA Rams system. He's probably going to be your next NFL head coach. He's probably working himself right into a gig, which is really, really exciting. But as we get ready to wrap up, man, I apologize that you cut out during the AJ Dillon play, man. Yeah, we got the gist of it. We got the majority of it, but no, that's um, all good. I was looking forward to that. Uh, real quick before we do wrap up, because somehow, bro, I think we got this under an hour, so I'm gonna steal a couple of minutes here. Mm -hmm. Just talk about kind of the, those those different um, things that put stressors on defense now as you prepare for Green Bay. Now you've watched the fastest kid on the field do it twice now. I believe his first touchdown was a jet sweep to the edge where he he went and scored his first NFL touchdown. You see him do it here again to ice a game. What's that gonna do to a defense? Well, when Watson is off the line and able to go in motion, it's probably gonna keep you out of man coverage, right? And if it's got to keep you out of man coverage, because you know that dude is faster and better than all your other dudes in man coverage, well, now you got to play zone. And what can't you do a lot in zone? You can't bring a ton of pressure. How do you beat Aaron Rodgers? You pressure him, and you pressure him, and you play man coverage, and you smother on cover one, right? Like that's been kind of the formula you've seen is get after him and rattle that cage early. Well, if you can't do that because Christian Watson is an end-around threat, so you got to get out of man, and you – you can't really pressure Rodgers because now you got to stay in zone so that you got a secondary edge support. What, like, what do you do? You know yeah. what I mean? Like, those are those little things that keep adding up for a defensive coordinator where it's like, who baby, you know, do you start passing off Christian Watson's mo motion? Then all of a sudden you're down a hat in the run game. You know what I mean? So it's, it's those things where it's like a pick your poison. Now when green Bay starts clicking. And they've definitely gotten away from the RPO here recently. And now that teams, now that they've adjusted and they're starting to have a lot of success, defenses, everything's cyclical. It's a copycat league. They're going to watch the tape. They're going to watch a, a two, three game saturation and go, okay, here's what Green Bay's doing. Don't be surprised if the RPOs reemerge here in the next few weeks as well. It's just, I love football, man. Even in a down year as a Packer fan, 
I just love that game of chess. It's something I've always been interested in. And, uh, man, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to come on with us and uh, and break this stuff down. I, I'm with you. I don't know how we got this in under an hour. It's unbelievable, man. So, um, well, any part of that cut out. We bought an extra 10 minutes there because I was going to talk 10 minutes plus <laughs> on wide zone left. <laughs> I love it, man. Love it. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about offline, and we will wrap up with this, is, you know, we typically go, okay, is it, is it coaching or is it the players at fault, right? And I think the boring answer, but most of the time it's kind of the common answer is it's probably a little bit of both. But one thing we don't talk about is differentiating between when you take coaching, you break it down. It really comes down to coaching and scheme on that kind of that arm of what's going on on the field. For me, the scheme isn't the problem. I don't think the Fangio defense is a problem here. I think it's simply players aren't executing. And, and I can see how player, or, you know, fans would be like, okay, that is on the coaches to prepare the players, but at the same time, players have to execute. Do you see any reason that Green Bay should go away from the Fangio scheme? Forget firing people and, and all that, you know, personalized garbage that we see. I, first of all, I've never seen – I don't understand how people can get so happy about saying that someone needs to lose their job, but for whatever reason they do, that's not my style personally. But from just a scheme standpoint, do you think Green Bay should move away from the Fangio screen or from or from the scheme, or do you think from what we've seen this year, you think, no, the Fangio scheme is still strong as it's ever been. We just need to start executing better. What do you think? That's, that's such an excellent question, man. And as a coach, dude, I'm so glad you bring that stuff up. Um, number one, because it does suck to get fired. Like it just, it's gutting and it, it is what it is. I get it. You're a professional. You're at the top level, like whatever, but it's still like, we're still humans, right? It's still just, Absolutely. Sucks. so, so I, I appreciate you bringing that up and having that insight. Um, as far as the scheme goes, yo, I do think the scheme is still sound. It's a gap sound scheme. You're putting your best players in positions to make plays. You got all the gaps accounted for. You've got sound coverage fits. You know, you are going to give up a little bit, but yo, at the end of the day, you gave a professional football team, you held them to 19 points. Like, that's, right. that's pretty good, like, overall, right? You forced two turnovers. You could have probably had three. Like, there's – I mean, there's – you could have probably forced three. Your offense is taking care of the ball. Like, in my opinion, the defense is doing what it has to do to win. You're not seeing the big blowouts. You're not seeing the 35, 42, 45-point explosions like we're used to seeing, but I got a, a feeling that that's coming with while watching everything click the way it's starting to do um, with the offense. So I got a feeling that's coming, but yo, your defense is pretty sound, I think. And I, I'm glad you brought this up because it, it just rings in my head that the best coaches are always teachers first, right? So all of us can learn scheme. Anybody can know scheme, right? You, I'm reading a Cody Alexander book right now where this dude's forgotten more about football than I'll ever know. And it is scheme heavy and it is beautiful. It's glorious, right? It's amazing. We can all learn scheme. You can pick that up from Amazon and learn scheme, right? But it's how to get the other people to know it and then how to see their job and their role and how they fit and why they're so important in it. And it's getting them to know everybody around. It's getting them to know a trap try drill. It's getting them to see the importance in some of this stuff that we're doing in practice, that we're doing in film study, and how that relates on a Sunday. And that's where, you know, at times, I don't want to say it's Joe Barry because I have no idea what that, that situation is over there, but at times that's where the disconnect is. Very rarely do you see guys come out and just are dumb and don't know what they're doing, especially in the NFL, right? You have scheme soundness. What you need to do is provide that scheme soundness to a 21-year-old kid who has every other distraction in the world going on right now. You know what I mean? So like, that's where some of the best teachers come through. Maybe not the best scheme guy, maybe not the Belichick type coach or uh, scheme guy, but the Belichick type coach where you can relate and you can say in four words, what it's just taken me a minute and 17 seconds to say. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's what Lombardi was so good at. A lot of people don't know that Lombardi was actually a teacher, you know, obviously before he was a coach, he actually took on the role of being the high school basketball coach at the high school he was at. If I believe it was high school and really, really cool story. They said he had no, no, uh, whatever you want to say, history or experience in coaching basketball. He purchased a book and read it front to back and he taught everything in that book. And they were talking about uh, specific schemes there within basketball. And one of the guys that he coached, he talked about how he lifted his play 
I think his name was Mickey Corcoran. I believe is how you say his name. I, I, ho I hope I, I'm not getting the names mixed up. Long story short, he goes on to coach a young basketball player named Bill Parcells. Bill Parcells goes on to be a head coaching legend. And what did Bill Parcells do? He brought Mickey along with him through everything. So how cool is it that because Lombardi had a background in teaching, he teaches this guy, you know, the game of basketball, who goes on to teach the game of basketball and just just winning in general and and learning, you know, teaching people how to coach people along and and and, and relate to people to Bill Parcells, who then goes on to win, I believe, two Super Bowls, who then goes on to train up a defensive coordinator named Bill Belichick, who goes on to win six championships and becomes the GOAT of NFL coaching. It's just it's amazing when you dig into the National Football League. And it's why I try to challenge fans and more specifically Packer fans. Let's get past the screaming and shouting. Let's get past the finger pointing. And once you really dig in and learn not only how the game is played schematically, but also the history of the game and, and everything that's come before them. It's just amazing. And what you said about teaching players. I mean, some players learn by hearing. Some, some players learn by seeing. Other players learn by being hands-on and actually experiencing doing stuff. And you've got to cover all three of those guys. That's that's been scientifically proven that different people learn different ways, right? And uh, like you said, teaching that to a 21 year old kid. When I was 21, coach, I was a knucklehead, man. I didn't I didn't know whether I was coming or going. So that's uh, good stuff, man. Well, listen, I appreciate your time. I'm not going to take up any more of it, dude. It is always awesome to have you on the show. Can't thank you enough. We're going to get out of here. For those of you who tuned in on Twitter and YouTube tonight, we really appreciate your time. For those of you listening to the podcast on Tuesday afternoon, we hope you guys have an awesome, awesome work day. And, uh, yeah, have a have a great evening as you get ready to wrap up. Be safe traveling home. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. Go Pack Go.